Man, isn't it, isn't it good to sing that declaration? Like God is moving all around us and, and I'm so glad you're here this weekend. I, I wanna remind you next weekend, Mother's Day, we're gonna honor moms in a really fun way. You don't wanna miss it. And if you are a mom, here's my advice to you. If you have had a hard time getting your kids or maybe some of your family members to come to church with you, here's what you say. When they say, what do you want for Mother's Day? You say, I just want you to come to church with me. I mean, how are they supposed to turn that down, right? So uh, moms, we love you. We're gonna have a lot of fun next weekend. But this weekend, we're, we're continuing this series we've been in that we started last weekend called Letters from my future self. And the whole idea is if, if you could go back in time and write yourself a letter to your younger, you know, that dumber version of you, what would you say? And last week I shared some, some fun examples of, of some things I'd say to myself. One of them being, Ashley, in 1997, do not get on stage at that Cirque du Soleil show because you're gonna get your pants pulled down in front of almost 2,000 people, including your future wife and, and in-laws. So if you were here, you heard that story. Uh, what's interesting is on Monday morning, I got into the office and I got this email from Mark, who attends one of our campuses. He said, Ashley, in September 1997, my best friend and his wife asked us if we wanted to take a trip to Las Vegas. <laughs> now, he, he, he ends up going to the Cirque du Soleil show. It wasn't the same show I got my pants pulled down, and this is about three months later. He's there in September. He said, uh, we went to the Cirque du Soleil show. I was on the second row. Intermission, this really fat baby walked on stage and pointed a spotlight on me. I tried not to draw eye contact, but I began getting booed. My wife and friends just said, get on stage. So I reluctantly went on stage. Next thing I know, someone came up behind me and depanced me down to my boxers. I too have never been quite able to explain how it happened. <laughs> For years, I'd tell that story and no one would believe me. He said, finally last weekend, I realized there's someone else that shares my pain. You know? So uh, Mark and I have started a support group. Uh, for uh, <laughs> We think there's more of you out there. But uh, can I share a few more funny things I tell myself in the past? Um, here, here's one. I would say, dear Ashley, you've grown up in Arizona your entire life. You've barely seen a lick of snow. But trust me, one day you won't just need to know what a snowblower is. You'll need to know how much a snowblower costs. Ashley, in college, you're gonna be called down to contestants row on The Price is Right, right? You're gonna go nuts, right? You're gonna go nuts. Ashley, the only way you're gonna get off contestants row is if you remember, a snowblower does not cost $1,200. That's what you bid, you moron, all right? <laughs> Repeat after me, Ashley. A snowblower costs $579, all right? So I tell myself that. I didn't get off contestants row. Uh, here's number two. Ashley, as you transition into adulthood, you are going to want to be seen as very self-sufficient and strong, and you will rarely ask for help. It's a massive mistake. In fact, in the year 2000, you're gonna buy your first house and within months of having that house, you'll be doing a repair upstairs and you're gonna break a main water line. Water will come gushing out and in your pride, you'll spend 50 minutes trying to fix it on your own. Your entire upstairs will be flooded. In fact, um, water will begin seeping down from the upstairs, downstairs. I remember the, the ceiling fan, just water's just gushing down from the ceiling fan. It starts flooding our downstairs. Ashley, finally, in your, in, you'll humble yourself. You'll walk across the street and ask a neighbor for help. Within 90 seconds, he'll have the water turned off. <laughs> but not before you have thousands of dollars in repair. Ashley, ask for help sooner. It will teach you a valuable lesson that asking for help is not weak. In many ways, it's the strongest thing you can do. You know, last week I said one of the top letters I'd write to myself is I'd say, Ashley, stop worrying so much, and that's what we talked about last weekend, but, but this weekend, I'm telling you, at the top of my list, I would tell myself, Ashley, ask for help. And I don't, I don't mean just help from God. I mean, that's kind of the easy one. We're always crying out to God, God, help me, help me, God. I mean, like, the harder thing is to go to an actual somebody else and actually ask them for help, to ask them for godly wisdom and advice and in all areas of life. And I, I'm embarrassed to tell you the number of times like in my life I've just, I've just been so prideful and I haven't, 
I haven't asked for help. Anybody else struggle asking for help out there? You don't have to raise your hands, but, but I wonder if, if you ask, you, you struggle asking for help at Home Depot. You struggle asking for help in, in your marriage, your parenting, your finances, or with an addiction. Every single study, and I'm gonna give you a pop quiz, I want everyone to participate. Every single study out there says that between men and women, who struggles more asking for advice? I want you to vote, just raise your hand, okay? How many think women struggle more asking for advice? Raise your hands loud and proud. Okay, how many people think men struggle asking for advice? It's interesting, every study says that women struggle more. I'm kidding, it's not true at all, right? I mean, <laughs> you guys are like, what studies are you reading, right? Every study says men struggle more, right? In fact, this week I was reading an article and there's a new term that they've coined, researchers, and they call it male answer syndrome. Do you have male answer syndrome? Here's what male answer syndrome is. It's when a man doesn't know the answer, instead of just saying, I don't know, he just starts talking and faking it. Like nervous laughter, you ever been there? Why is it, let me ask, why is it that we struggle, some of us, so much just asking for help? Just asking for help. I like getting to root issues. Like last weekend, we said the root issue underneath so much of our worry and anxiety, what is it? It's, it's our desire for control. What's the root issue with us not wanting to ask for help? It's very simple. It's our pride. And in our pride, we don't want to look weak, incompetent, or needy. That's the issue. In fact, I'd, I'd say for many of you here today, you guys, like how many of you guys grew up and you were like, hey, you know, you know who I want to, you know who my hero is growing up? It was Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. Anybody like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo? You loved him? Why didn't you love Shaggy? Because look at him. The dude's weak. He's weak. You pretended to be who? Superman. Why? Because Superman is strong. And guess what? Superman never asked for help. That's how strong he was. The problem is Superman isn't real. <laughs> Muhammad Ali, a uh, story about him, he was not known for his humility, by the way, but Muhammad Ali was on an airplane once and he wasn't wearing his seatbelt and the flight attendant walked up to Muhammad Ali and said, Mr. Ali, you need to put your seatbelt on immediately. And Muhammad Ali looked at the flight attendant and said this, Superman don't need no seatbelt. Which she immediately quickly replied, Superman don't need no airplane either, <laughs> right? But I'm just telling you, what I would say is this, what I would say is this. When it comes to asking for help, when it comes to asking for help, our desire to be viewed as Superman has become our kryptonite. Our desire to want to look strong and not look weak, that is a kryptonite that is holding you back in so many areas of life. Proverbs 13, 10 says this, where there's strife, there's pride. Think about this. Any area of your life right now that you have strife, there, there's trouble. You just can't seem to break through in a certain area of your life, or you just really feel like you're being held back. You know what is underneath it? This is just scripture. What's underneath it is your pride. So what's the answer? What's the answer? Wisdom is found in those who what? Say it out loud take advice. Oh, so I gotta, I gotta go ask for some advice. Not just God, I gotta go ask some other people for some advice. That's exactly right. Many of us need to reorient our mind around this idea. And here's what we need to know. Asking for help isn't weak. It may be the strongest thing you will ever do. Proverbs 15, uh, 22 is, is probably the proverb I quote the most. Um, it's just amazing. It's written by the, the wisest man who's ever lived, Solomon, and he says this, plans fail. Plans fail. Now, the word plan in the Hebrew just means your desires, your goals. So just think right now, what are your future desires and goals? And here's what Solomon says, all those future desires and goals, they fail for what? Lack of advice. But what many advisors bring success. 
Now, the word advisors here is a, is a Hebrew word that underneath it is the root word for to consult someone, to ask for advice. And what's interesting is the first time this root word is ever used in scripture is where I want to take you today to, to land for our scripture today. It's Exodus chapter 18, the first time this root word is ever used to get some advice. And it's a man in scripture that almost, almost in his pride didn't ask for help. And he almost destroyed himself and everyone around him. Not just himself, everyone around him. It's, this, it's actually the early story of Moses' leadership. Now, if you know anything about Moses, Moses was the man that God chose to lead the people out of 40 years of bondage and slavery in Egypt to the promised land. And God chooses Moses. And Moses is a very reluctant leader, to be honest. He's, he's actually viewed by most people early on, the Israelites, as, as really weak. They don't want to listen to him. Moses makes all sorts of excuses why God can't use him. But what's happened in, in right now in the story is God has used Moses in a miraculous way to deliver the people. They're outside of Egypt now. God's parted the Red Sea. Moses has some success where he was viewed as weak. Now he's viewed as pretty strong. I mean, he's, he's got the people out. The people are like, Moses, you're the man. And what I think happens, my hunch is, is Moses wants to keep up this really strong image. And he almost, almost messes it all up. And what God does, and, and if you don't think there's humor in scripture, if you don't think God has a sense of humor, I promise you he does. And I'm like cracking up in my office this week studying this because who does God bring along to help Moses learn how to ask for help? His father-in-law. Is that, does anybody, is God gonna have a sense of humor? For most guys, especially early in marriage, who's the last person you wanna ask for help from? Your wife is like, honey, just call my dad. Like, pipe down, woman. I'm not calling your dad. Right, because you're like, you want to look strong. God sends Moses' father-in-law to teach him about asking for help, which means any of us can ask for help. Let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter 18, starting in verse 7. It says this, so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. Moses' father-in-law shows up on the scene right after God's rescued them all, and they're, they're kind of just past the Red Sea, and they're in the, the, the you know, desert now, and, and, God, and Moses' father-in-law shows up, and it says that Moses bowed down, kissed him, they greeted each other, and went inside the tent. Now, now this would kind of be the equivalent, and if your father-in-law showed up to your house and you guys just exchange pleasantries. How you doing? Oh, good to see you. And your father-in-law's like, let's go to the garage and talk man to man. So Moses and his father-in-law go into the tent. And, and you can kind of just picture Moses' father-in-law being like, hey, Moses, like man to man. Like, you know, how's it going? How's it going with you? Very next verse, verse 8. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done. Now, we don't know exactly what Moses told his father-in-law, but could you just imagine Moses is like, so then, you know, Pharaoh's like, I'm not going to let you go. And I was like, really? Bam, you know, and frogs, and then, and, then, and then finally you let us go, and then we parted the Red Sea, and people were freaking out, and I was like, settle down, God's got this, and he took us through the Red Sea, and here we are, and, and, it's, and Moses led a million people out of Egypt, and, and Moses is like, hey, you know, so here I am, leading a million people probably never thought your son-in-law be this big a time of a leader. I mean, your daughter's pretty lucky, right? <laughs> you know, I don't know what Moses, I don't know what Moses' father-in-law said. I'm sure he was really impressed, right? I mean, he may, he may have even said to Moses, like, hey, Moses, do you need, you need any help with anything? Oh, no. I've got this just fine. You, 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 just, you just relax. Verse 13. The very next day, the very next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. Now please understand what's happening. Okay, here's what's happening. If you've got a million people around you, you have a million problems. It's just true. And what Moses does is he sets himself up as the single end all judge and leader for everyone. So if anyone has a problem, they go to one person, Moses. And it says from morning, all day long till evening, all Moses does is try to deal with everybody on his own. He never asks anybody else for help because he's the man, right? And what Moses' father-in-law asks him next is a really interesting question. I mean, it's a good question. Moses' father-in-law, verse 14. Hey, Moses, <clears throat> why do you alone sit as judge? 
while all these people stand around you from morning till evening. In other words, Moses, why on earth wouldn't you ask some other people for help? And watch Moses' answer, because I just want you to hear his answer, because I would call this the leader's trap. It's the trap that so many of us fall into. And Moses says this, just kind of blurts it out. Verse, next verse. Moses answered him, because the people come to me. They come to me to seek God's will. And whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me. And I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. You notice the me, I language. In other words, I'm the man. And if people come to me, I have to be the one that has all the answers because they're coming to me. And I want to just speak to leaders for a minute because we have so many leaders in our church. Whether you're leading a team, whether you're leading a business, whether you're a mom at home leading those little rascals running everywhere. I want to say to you today this. Do you understand when someone comes to you with a question or a problem, you don't have to be the one that has the answer? I mean, it just, it, just, it just feeds our pride to even think that we wouldn't be the one that has the answer. Did you know God didn't design you to be the one that has all the answers? Did you know when you set yourself up like Moses does as the one that has all the answers, can I tell you what will immediately happen? I don't care if it's your parenting, your business, your leadership, you will become the bottleneck for everyone growing and yourself growing immediately. You'll be the bottleneck for growth. I'll just use myself as an example. I mean, I, I, I've had to learn so much about this over the years with, with leadership. I mean, think about CCV for a minute. I mean, just imagine our church. Imagine if, if tomorrow I set myself up at CCV exactly like Moses did. And I said, hey, anybody across our 12 campuses, soon to be, you know, later this year, I mean, we'll have 14 campuses going on 15, 16. Every staff member, every single person in the congregation, if you have a question or a problem, you come to this guy. Do you know what would immediately happen to our church? First of all, I wouldn't preach another message in my life. I would have no time to study, no time to prepare. I would have no time to lead and vision cast in the future. Zero. All I would do till morning, till evening, is I would just wear myself out and I'd wear you out. And immediately, I would become the bottleneck to all that God wants to do in our church. We become irrelevant overnight. And by the way, most churches in America are not growing. And the issue is this. It's not preaching. It's not ministry strategy. The issue with most churches is leadership. There's a bottleneck at the top because sometimes leaders get into this trap thinking, I'm the end all be all. I have to be involved in everything and everything has to come to me. What a limited view of thinking. And God did not design you to be the end all be all. And if you operate that way, you know what you'll do? You'll never surround yourself with people that can help the way God designed it. And that's why at CCV, I want to say this. I am so thankful at our church that we have the amazing staff we have from our campus pastors. Our campus pastors are incredible to our associate pastors, to our kids and student pastors, to our special needs pastors, to our stars pastors. And by the way, the heroes of this church from our executive team to others. You know what the heroes of our church though are really? The heroes of our church are those of you that step up and volunteer and lead in so many areas of our church. Do we not have so many people around here that are leading in so many great capacities? Can we, can we thank them today? Like that's, that's what makes up a great church. That's what makes up a great church. And Moses, he just kind of, he falls into this trap of thinking he has to be the end all be all. And so what, what Moses' father-in-law Jethro says next to him, somebody needs to hear today. Here's what Moses' father-in-law says next. He looks at Moses, everything that he's doing and how he operates, and here's what he says. What you are doing, say it loud and proud, is not good. Someone today, you're operating all alone. It's all on you. You don't ask anybody, hardly ever, for their help. And God looks at you and says, 
That is not good. He goes on to say this, you and, and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. Now notice what he says, not only you, Moses, are gonna wear yourself out, you're wearing all the people out, which is such a great principle. When you operate like it all depends on you, here's what happens. You won't just, when you won't ask for help, you don't just wear yourself out, you wear out everyone else around you. And there's a parent here today that you won't ask for help and you're wearing your kids out because they need you to get advice for someone else that's gonna help them, but you're wearing them out because it all depends on you. And so Moses' father-in-law goes on. He says, the, the work's too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. I love that. In every area of your life, it's too heavy for you to do it on your own. Like every single area, I don't care what area it is, you weren't designed to do it on your own without asking for help from other people. So verse 19, he says, listen now and I'm gonna give you some advice. And here we see the, that root word from, from the same exact word in Proverbs 15, 22. It's the root Hebrew word for advice. First time it's ever used. And it's, it's a father-in-law giving advice to his, his son-in-law. I just think that's funny. But the advice that Moses gets, I'll, I'll encourage you to go read all of chapter 18 this week. The advice is incredible. Moses' father-in-law says, hey Moses, I'm not telling you not to lead. Keep leading. I'm just gonna tell you, surround yourself with some really capable people and ask them for help and it's gonna go so much better. And, and by the way, it did. It transformed the nation of Israel by one piece of advice, one piece of advice and what, what Moses does next is so amazing. Verse 24, it, and just listen to this. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said, which I think is great because sometimes we listen to advice and then what do we do? We go do whatever we want. Moses did everything he was told from this godly man. And then at the very end of Exodus chapter 18, and I, I just like showing you the humor in scripture. This is hilarious to me. And this is just free today, okay? It has nothing to do with the message. This is just free. The very end of Exodus chapter 18 ends this way. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way. <laughs> do you see the humor? It's like sometimes the in-laws, it's like, this is awesome, but it's time for you to go. <laughs> That's what he did. That's what he did, sent him on his way. But I want to take chapter 18, and I want to just pull out three things we can learn about asking for help straight from this account from scripture. And if you're taking notes today, um, here's number one. You may be one piece of advice away from a better future. What's amazing to me is no matter what you're dealing with today, I don't care what the issue is, I don't care what the, the tension is, whatever you're dealing with today, listen to me, God has an answer for you. He already has the answer. And here's what I know, that answer often comes only when you ask someone else for their advice. It's out there, you may not have the answer because you're not willing to ask. And some of you are like, why wouldn't God just give it to me? And he sometimes does, right? He gave us our, his word, he gave us prayer, but do you understand God designed you to be in community and to rely on other people and oftentimes God wants to speak through other people so that he can strip us of our pride because if he just gave us the answer every single time, do you understand? It would, it would build up a little bit of like self-sufficiency in us. We'd be like, we don't need anybody else. And God's like, no, no, no. I want you to rely on other people because self-sufficiency is a myth that is based on pride and sometimes temporary success. You need other people, but you may be one piece of advice away from the future God wants for you. Here's, here's the second thing I think we can learn. Asking for help isn't admitting failure, it's pursuing success. <sighs> Man, some of you need to reorient your mind around what it looks like to be successful in life. And Proverbs says that success comes with many, advisor, in many advisors. That's not weak. The strongest people I know in my life, the most successful people I know, are the people that ask the most advice. I'll give you an example. There's, there's a, a friend of mine who's a, a CEO in our church, and 
I love this guy to death. And just to give you a, a, just some context of, of what he leads, he leads a company that has $550 million in revenue a year. I mean, it's massive and thousands of employees. And he's a godly man and he's just doing a great job. And, and the more I've been around him, I've just observed something about him that blows my mind. He asks for advice almost more than anybody else I know. And he's one of the greatest leaders I know. And here's the thing, he's not young. He's in his 60s. I mean, at some point you'd think like, hey, I've been leading long enough, I'm in my 60s. I know what I'm doing now. You never age out of asking for advice. And this guy's asking for advice all the time. You know what's crazy? He comes across really young. He doesn't look like he's in his 60s. And I think his youth, part of it, is dictated because he is not afraid to ask advice from anybody. He does it all the time. Here's the third thing I want to I look at today. And, and this is the one someone, God brought you here just for this. The quality of people you surround yourself with will determine the quality of the advice you get. It's been said, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. The quality of the people you have around you right now will 100% dictate the quality of the advice you're gonna get into your life right now. And this is the one for me that concerns me the most for most people. It blows me away, like blows me away, how many people don't get quality advice from quality people. And here's what I would say. And lean in. There's not a person here today that's not getting advice. Like you're getting advice. And some, 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 somebody just said, thank you. Finally he said it. Like he's been talking about get help. I get advice all the time. All the time. I ask Siri. I ask Alexa. I ask YouTube. I get on social media. I mean, I get on those reels. And I'm telling you, man. I get on TikTok. And I get on Facebook and Instagram. I mean, there is crazy advice everywhere. I'm always getting advice. No, no, come on. Are you getting quality advice? Like godly advice? What I want to do on this one is I want to give you my five requirements for getting wise advice. Wise advice. Advice that's going to change your life, okay? And if you want to take notes, here's number one for me. Um, you have to choose a follower of Jesus. I mean... <laughs> I mean, we're not going to get legalistic about this. I'm not saying that I won't go to a doctor or won't ask the guy at Home Depot. I'm like, hey, have you been baptized? Because I need some screws, you know? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking about that, right? <laughs> I'm just saying, for the things that matter. <laughs> for the things that matter, you should be asking another Christian. And here's why. The worst advice you get that turns you in, in the wrong direction is advice where someone's values don't align with your values as a follower of Jesus. I'm telling you. Here's number two. Choose experience over influence. I get so scared when I look at the number of people that are looking to influencers in our society for advice and the influencer has no experience. I mean, it's crazy to me. And I want to tell you this. Just because someone's a celebrity doesn't mean they have godly wisdom. Let me say it again for somebody. Just because someone's a celebrity and famous doesn't mean they have godly wisdom. Come on, right? That's not stupid. That's so dumb. I don't care how many followers you have. I care how many years of experience you have. You know why I didn't get on The prices Right? Can I, can I share the real reason? It's because every item that came up for bid, that snowblower came for bid, you know what I did? I turned around and looked to my 19-year-old idiot friends for advice <laughs> that have never bought a snowblower. They have no idea. Did I look in the audience and go, oh, oh, that person looks wise. They look a little older, right? They look like they have an experience. No, I looked to my 19-year-old peers. And that's what some of you are doing. You're looking to your peers and some sort of influencer for advice, and it's jacking you. And I want to tell someone this. You will never, ever get to where you want to go 
until you start asking people that have already been down that road, that have experience. You choose experience over influence every single time. Here's number three. Ask people that know you the best and love you the most. Now you have to ask people that know you because here's what happens. We sometimes ask people that don't know us at all and then we snowball them with all of our excuses. You need someone that can call you out on, no, 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 I know you. Ask someone that knows you and ask someone that loves you and this is super practical. I just think it's hard, very practically, to ask someone for advice that you know doesn't care about you. And I wanna tell someone today, you have a lot of wisdom, you have a lot of experience, and you're, you're confused that nobody comes to you and asks for your advice. And I wanna just challenge you, maybe that's because you don't care for and love other people well. You can have all the wisdom in the world, but if you don't have love, you're missing the foundation for people coming to you and asking for advice. Here's, here's number four. Ask more than one person. Let's go back to Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of advice, but say it out loud. One advisor. Oh, no, 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 no. It says, it says many advisors. Oh, so I gotta, I gotta ask multiple people? Yeah, but I might be bugging them. No, you might be blessing them. Yeah, but I like going to one person because I like going to the one person I know is gonna already agree with me. You think I gotta ask multiple people? What if someone doesn't agree with where I'm already leaning? That's the point. Every leader knows you should surround yourself with people that don't just think exactly like you do and don't see exactly the way you do because some of the best advice you'll ever get in your life is when people have a different perspective, a godly perspective still, but a different perspective than you have. And I'll tell you what, last year, um, Jamie and I ha had a pretty big decision we were trying to make, and as we were looking to advisors, we asked multiple advisors in our life, but we specifically went to one married couple that we knew we thought would disagree with where we were already leaning. I wanna tell you, it was some of the best advice we ever got. And I, and, and some of us are just so afraid to do this, especially like when we're in a relationship or we're dating someone or you know, we have a big financial decision that we're already there and we just want everyone to align with us. Ask someone that will, that, that, that more, than, more than just one person, right? Just ask more than one person. And, and here's, here's a second, I've already kind of led into this a little bit. Ask someone you know will likely disagree with you. You gotta ask someone that'll disagree with you for all the reasons we just said, not just one person, but multiple people and at least one person that you think will disagree with you. Where do you need some advice? Like what, what area of your life right now? You know, for some of you, you've got a really big future decision and you know how you're leaning, but if you got multiple advisors to weigh in, like godly, Jesus-loving people that love you, some of you have a child right now. And I'll tell you what, parenting in this, this day and age, it's hard. Some of you have a child and they're, they're so wayward right now, you would ship them to another country tomorrow if you could, right? I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> And I'm just telling you right now, there is a parent in this service that has the answers you need. You're just not asking. In fact, there, there, I know for a fact there's parents in our, our CCV groups. That's why we're always trying to get you into a CCV group because there's wisdom there. But there, there, there's parents inside of our CCV groups that can help you. And some of you push back for so long. I don't have time to be in a group during the week. I mean, I have kids and activities and work. I'm just telling you, come on. Could one hour in a CCV group, you getting great wisdom and advice, save you five to 10 hours of pain you deal with every single week? Yes. Some of you have an addiction and you've hidden it, tried to deal with it on your own. I'll kick this. Stop, stop. You're one Ask for help away from your life changing. 
By the way, the truth's gonna come out at some point. Why shouldn't it come out from you? It's a lot less painful. Some of you financially are, are in debt and it's embarrassing and you're not getting help. You're trying to solve it on your own. You just get yourself deeper into this hole. And we have so many resources at CCV. I mean, we have Financial Peace University. We have financial advisors. You have someone around you right now you could ask for advice. And your own pride's keeping you back. Some of you have a marriage right now that's hurting. And you're just trying to do it alone. It's you. I had a friend that was a professional athlete for many, many years and his marriage was hurting, I mean bad. I said, hey, have you, have you, you got some help? He's like, no. So let me, let me ask you, you, you ever been really injured when you were playing professionally? He said, oh, I had this massive injury and this injury. I said, did you ever try to rehab on your own? He's like, no, that would be stupid. There are some hurts in marriage that you will not overcome unless you get some help. Get into a group, godly couples around you. Get into counseling. Listen, you, you can't go back in time and write yourself a letter. But you can ask for help today. And remember, you might be one piece of advice away from a better future. Amen.